So, I really liked Toy Story 4. I think the general consensus around social media is like, that was pretty good. It wasn't as good as Toy Story 3, but it was pretty good. I mean, except the people who are just like, I didn't like it at all. I actually don't agree with either of those. I think as far as comedy, it was funnier than Toy Story 3. I think it's the funniest one so far, and I don't think it's bad. I was virtually, like, no hype for it whatsoever. But then, like, a half hour in, I was like, oh, that's right, I love these characters. Like, I could just watch Infinite episodic, inconsequential sequels that are just like an adventure the characters are having because I love the characters. I'm sitting there in my theater seat like, yes, I'm down for this. This is a good time. And then the movie kept going. And I mean, actually, Toy Story 4 kind of ruined the whole series. I think everybody's unfounded fear was that Toy Story 4 would be that thing I was saying before where it's like an episodic, meaningless movie that they didn't have to make. And they were bitter about the idea of this harmless but inconsequential sequel because Toy Story 3 was the perfect ending, so why undermine that? But in hindsight, Toy Story 3 wasn't even the perfect ending to the series. And I didn't realize that until I saw Toy Story 4. Thanks, Toy Story 4. Let me walk you through this. Oh, spoilers, by the way, for Toy Stories 1, 2, 3, and 4. Toy Story 4 opens with Woody kind of upset that he's no longer Bonnie's favorite toy. And not just not her favorite, but like she's not even pulling him out of the closet to play with most days. But he seems to be doing okay. Like later she has to pick 12 or so toys to take on vacation. He's one of the ones she picks. It's a little wishy-washy, especially since this whole not being the favorite complex was like the journey that Woody already had to take in Toy Story 1 and we thought he was bigger than that. Anyway, the rest of the movie deals with Woody reuniting with Bo Peep, who has decided to take on the life of being a lost toy, which basically means not belonging to any child, just striking out on her own, finding her own sources of happiness. Woody is forced to confront the idea of what he wants out of life and decide where he's going to derive his sense of purpose. A lot of people say the whole Toy Story series is a metaphor for parenthood, which it isn't really. If anything, the first movie is more about getting a sibling or a new person joining your friend group, which is good because the movie is for children, so these are more apt lessons than parenthood. Arguably, Toy Story 2 and 3 are a little more about parenthood. Loosely, it's not a one-one correlation. There are individual scenes and lines of dialogue that point to that kind of connection, but it's not consistent. I think it's fair for somebody to say, Parenthood is a theme of Toy Story 2 and 3, but I don't think it's fair for somebody to say Parenthood is the theme. The other very popular read is Andy slash all children as God. In Toy Story 3, the villain has a line where he's like, where's your kid now, Sheriff? And everybody's like, oh. It's God. I think that one line is the reason everybody thinks it's a theme. Otherwise, I think the connection is even weaker than the parenthood one. I can't imagine anyone thinking for longer than about 30 seconds and earnestly claiming that Woody's relationship to Andy is similar to anyone's relationship to God. Andy is an active, seeable, knowable, and also constantly changing presence in their lives. And who fights for God's attention? Who feels anxiety that God will replace them with a cool spaceman? Thematically, what are we meant to understand from Woody's reassurance to Jesse that Andy has a little sister? If your God forsakes you, you can just switch to another religion? With, with a different younger god. Ugh, it's messy. The last theme I would imagine is mortality and the acceptance of it. Uh, let's put a pin in that one. So nobody was asking, but here's my read. Basically, the children that own the toys in Toy Story do not represent your parents or your children or your god. I don't believe that the children have a thing they're supposed to thematically be. They are not any specific thing. They are just a thing which gives toys a sense of purpose in service of a general theme about a fear of being abandoned or replaced. And then each film in the series reaches a different and sort of increasingly more mature conclusion about this. Toy Story 1 says, don't worry, you can't be replaced or abandoned. There is always room for more people in your family or community or friend group, and you provide something unique so you don't have to feel threatened by newcomers. Toy Story 2 says, don't worry, you might be replaced or abandoned, but not for a really long time. So in the meantime, you're in for a great ride. And then, you know, by the time it happens, you'll have been able to make your peace with it. 
Probably. Toy Story 3 says, I have finally made my peace with the idea of being replaced or abandoned, and I will accept it gracefully. I mean, that's a bit of a bummer, right? But with that in mind, I actually feel like Toy Story 4's conclusion is a lot more uplifting. Toy Story 4 says, I was wrong to ever worry about being replaced or abandoned. That actually never mattered, because people have more than one purpose in their entire lives. I can just find a new hobby. I mean, isn't that happier? Ow, what is that? Oh, it's that pin! That pin I put in mortality. Okay, so if the movies are about mortality, here's what they say. Toy Story 1 does not appear to say anything about mortality, but if it does, I guess it says, I will never die. Great, love it. Toy Story 2 says, maybe someday I will die, but not for like a really, really long time, so I'll make my peace with it when it's closer. The museum is immortality, I guess. Um, it's living an unfulfilled but endless life. So the moral of Toy Story 2 is actually, do not become a vampire. Man, a vampire who looks and speaks like Woody would be a delight though. Toy Story 3 says I have accepted my own mortality. You even have that scene with all the characters going into the furnace and the part where they all accept their own mortality. But wait, they don't die? they get rescued. I mean, I get that they're rescued by a claw reaching down from the heavens, but what, the aliens are God? And I know we don't have to see the characters die to understand that they accepted their own mortality, but it still doesn't really work as a theme. I guess in the mortality read, the daycare is supposed to represent heaven? or purgatory or some kind of afterlife? Well, no, the main cast of toys don't end up at the daycare, they end up at Bonnie's house. And Bonnie's house isn't understood to be a permanent state, so it's not really heaven, and it's kind of functionally the same as Andy's room. So that's more like reincarnation. Well, man, tangible confirmed proof of reincarnation or an afterlife kind of ruins the idea of accepting your own mortality, because isn't a large part of that embracing the uncertainty of it? And that's not even the biggest problem. Yeah, I'm not done. People find the idea of reincarnation comforting because it doesn't end. Your life isn't over, your soul doesn't disappear, it keeps going, presumably forever. But that's not the case with toys. They can't just be given to an infinite number of children. Toys are locked into a physical shell. They're destructible. But not just that, their desirability actively decreases the longer they've been around. Even if they somehow escape damage and decay for years and years, kids just aren't always going to want to play with an antique cowboy doll. Even the after Afterlife, if that's what daycare is, is not a permanent arrangement. I've never worked at a daycare, but I assume that they have a fairly high turnover rate of toys becoming destroyed or too dirty to give to children, and a pretty healthy influx of toys coming in from new donations. Toy Story 3's ending was superficially happy in a way that I was willing to accept. Okay, series over. The toys have a new kid now. Boy, I'm so happy for them. Some of their buddies are at daycare, and they can pass notes back and forth in Bonnie's back pack so they don't even lose touch. They're all still a big happy family. They're all comfortable. The gang didn't split up. A happy ending. You're probably like Jenny if you're going on about the mortality model. Where does Toy Story 4 fit in? And well, it doesn't. It doesn't fit in anywhere, does it? If you're looking for an actual catch-all, the mortality theme doesn't really work any better than the kids as God or toys as parents model. They're all just a big mess. I know we're in this age of like the Pixar theory or like the internet conspiracy theory that Tarzan is Elsa and Anna's brother. For some reason we've decided that things are cooler if we can arbitrarily string them together or if something dark happened in the past like an apocalypse or everybody's actually dead. But by trying to force all of the movies to have one specific theme when clearly they were not envisioned that way from the beginning, you're just kind of forcing yourself to make a lot of your points very sloppy. The only commonality between them is really just this general idea of learning to accept change, but not too much change. In Toy Story 1, your family might change by getting a new member of the family, but it's okay because your parents still love you. In Toy Story 2, Andy might actually stop loving you, but not for a really long time, and you'll make good memories, and he has a little sister, so let's not even worry about it right now. Can you tell that I didn't really like the theming of Toy Story 2? In Toy Story 3, you might end up having to leave your home, but it's okay because you and your friends are all together. And Toy Story 4 is about too much change. By making Toy Story 4 
and showing us the cycle beginning anew and that Bonnie is already beginning to get tired of Woody and that the whole thing is going to happen again. Not only is Pixar showing us that Toy Story 3 was not actually the happy ending they tricked us into thinking it was, but are in fact establishing that a happy ending for these toys is impossible. And that's why Toy Story 4 ruins the series. Toy Story 3 tricks us into thinking that the toys have reached some kind of happy ending, and Toy Story 4 clarifies that all happiness is fleeting and precarious. As a toy, you are constantly threatened with separation from your friends, which is understood to be permanent. Any forms of reunion or communication would be very conditional. Bonnie's toys in her room write notes back and forth with their friends that they left behind at the daycare, but what happens when Bonnie ages out of preschool? School and they can't pass notes in her backpack, and or her mom also stops working or volunteering at the preschool, or whichever we're meant to understand that she does. We see Trixie the dinosaur using her owner's computer when they are asleep to use a chat messenger to talk with another dinosaur, but how many toys are we meant to assume are doing that? What if they can't crack the password, or they're not tech savvy, or they're like a plush worm and they don't have arms they can use? Sure, Woody and Bo could journey back to Bonnie's house, by hitching rides or being toys on foot if they wanted to visit, but what if Bonnie ever moves? Even one time. I had the Toy Story Greatest Hits album queued up in the car to drive my friend to the movies, and then when we got back in the car after, it started playing the ending song from Toy Story 3. Remember that song? It's called we belong together. It's just Randy Newman singing over and over about how the toys are best friends and nothing's ever going to break them apart and everything's okay as long as they're together. And, and what was that, Randy? Was that all just a lie? What if instead of Andy's family basically only giving away Bo Peep and then giving away all of his toys at once to the preschool as a cohesive unit, Andy's family had instead just given away the toys in small waves, like one at a time, across the span of many years. Every toy in this universe will eventually, and often without any warning, be forcibly separated from all of their friends and loved ones. They will eventually be outgrown. Even if they find a new kid, they're just delaying the inevitable, buying themselves a teensy bit more time. The older that you get, that time must feel like it passes faster and faster. As we see with Gabby Gabby, they're all doomed from creation to crave being played with by a child. Someday they will all eventually be too old and unappealing and they will be unable to find their next kid. They will all eventually fall apart so much they can't function. Toy Story 4 is ostensibly about finding your own path to happiness and realizing that you don't have to live your life in service to others. Woody and Bo Peep see their own self-actualized happy ending by going out on their own to be lost toys. They decide to stop trying to belong to any children at all and they go off to see the world together. But there are two fatal flaws in this. First, we have Gabby Gabby. She's basically our Bo Peep character foil. She has spent decades craving a child to love and play with her and she believes this is the only thing that can make her happy. She thinks she is a failure and that she needs to repair herself so that she can become worthy of love. When Gabby finally fixes her broken voice, box, the little girl who's been rejecting her the whole movie just rejects her again. It makes no difference. This seems like it would be setting up a revelation where she decides to stop trying to please somebody that's never liked her and goes off to be a lost toy with Woody and Bo Peep and like recontextualizes what she wants out of life. But no, nope. Woody and gang put her in the path of another little girl who does love her and wants to take her home and then she's happy and it's framed as heartwarming. So, you know, she did need the validation of someone to make her life complete. Goodbye, theme. Safe travels. To add insult to injury, her new working voice box is instrumental in the little girl noticing her, so... I guess she did need to fix that flaw that she was born with. I have to assume there was a version of this story where Gabby did decide to give up on children and went off into the world with Woody and Bo Peep, and then either an executive or a test audience was like, it made me sad that the doll wanted a child to love her, and that never happened. I wanted to see that doll get hugged by a little girl, darn it. And so they just changed it and th ruined the theme. But if you think about it for even a second, it totally undermines Woody's whole journey of self-discovery 
discovery here. Anyway, that was a really long number one. I had two things that I wanted to talk about. Second, we have the problem that this whole Lost Toys narrative really drives home the unending uncertainty and torment that these toys are doomed to. Ultimately, Bo Peep's path does seem like the only one that's going to offer any long-lasting satisfaction. She's learned how to repair herself, she has a couple friends, she sees the world, she's just given up on interacting with human children at all. But the reason that's sad is that's not an option that could ever be available to every toy. There's just too many toys. As long as they're necessarily supposed to stay hidden from humans, this kind of lifestyle can only accommodate as many toys as can stay under the radar at one time. Remember that thing we were saying about toys accepting their figurative mortality? Well, that's a big aspect that it's figurative. We never see any confirmation that these toys can actually die. In 4, we hear about a cat brutalizing a plush toy, and then later in some kind of toy dance hall, we see the victim there just hanging out, like his body is mangled, but he's still alive. He's hanging open with his stuffing falling out, but he's just chilling. Sid dismantled his toys, he beheaded them and stuff, and stitched them together, and they were all still alive. Our main gang of toys are faced with an incinerator in Toy Story 3, and appear to believe it will kill them, but we don't even know if that happens. Toys don't die from old age, and they don't die from bodily trauma, so like, is there actually anything that will make their consciousness exit their little plastic bodies? If the toys had actually been incinerated, would they have died? Or would they have just been forced to lie for an eternity as a pile of conscious ash? Would the little ash particles be able to get up and hop around or what? You kind of want this lost toy lifestyle to catch on because it puts them in charge of their own destiny and their own self-worth. But if toys are immortal and there are more and more made each year, how is the world going to support this growing toy population? If every toy that becomes old and undesirable wants to go live as a lost toy, which I imagine eventually they all would, at least as an alternative to being burned to ash in a garbage dump, then like how are they all going to continue to escape notice? And what if you're a rocking horse or a four foot tall plush pork? You can't go run away as a lost toy because everyone would notice you moving around. You're giant. Do they get depressed about that? Do they feel upset about small toy privilege. If you follow it through to its conclusion, the only world in which these toys could be happy is a world in which they tell humans about their existence and demand the land that they need to establish their own communities. That said, ominously, this movie also features the most flexibility in how much toys are willing to make their presence known to humans. The key and peel, bird and bunny, keep proposing increasingly horrifying plans for just ambushing humans to get what they need, which was the funniest running joke in the movie by the way. Buzz Lightyear wants Bonnie to go to the antique store, so he just shouts, you need to go to the antique store, but in like a cadence where it sounds like one of his action phrases, which was another one of the funniest parts of the movie. I love that the toys don't care that much about the rules because the rules are arbitrary to begin with, but if you bundle that up with the rest of the conclusions this movie forces you to reach, all of that starts to feel more radical, like some kind of toy uprising is coming. Maybe if you bought into that Pixar theory, you could imagine that this led directly into the Cars universe because the toys overthrow the humans and eventually evolve into Cars. But I don't, because it's utter nonsense. There's this trend where every animated movie has to reassure you at the end that everything's ultimately okay by having a big stupid dance party. And usually you've gotten to a perfectly happy ending, so it feels very redundant. It's just lazy because it's a way to cut back to all the supporting characters that they're worried you forgot and be like, and that guy's happy too. And people like upbeat music so it gives your audience a little shot of adrenaline before they leave and like tricks them into thinking they enjoyed the movie more than they did. Toy Story 4 was the first time I was like, boy, I could really use a silly dance party right about now. Silly flamenco buzz, you got anything for me? There wasn't even a lyrical Randy Newman song at the end. It was just like sad instrumental. It's like, please Randy, come back. I need my dance party. Dance and tell me that everything's okay.